Hello everybody, today we are talking all about errors and uncertainties. This is a really, really key part of your course. It definitely will come up, certainly in paper three, but there's also uh, opportunities where you'll have to use this um, in paper two as well uh, when you're looking through this. So. We're going to look at the effect of particular types of errors and how we deal with them. Um, we are then going to uh, get the distinction between pr the terms precision and accuracy. And then we're going to uh, look at uncertainty in a derived quantity um, by how we combine it. So often that's called error propagation or um, propagation of errors. Okay, so thinking about errors and uncertainties. This is exactly the same as what you studied when you did your IGCSE. So it should be uh, relatively straightforward to you. Um, uncertainty. Um, that is an estimate of the difference between the reading and the true value of the quantity being measured. Um, so if I look at um, this table here, um, this is a typical thing. I've actually just taken to the IKEA website, so it gives me the dimensions of these uh, units. What you could expect is that these would probably have an accuracy of plus or minus one centimeter. So looking at these, because these are all to uh, the nearest whole centimeter, um, when I look at this, I would assume that the, probably the biggest I would expect this length to be um, would be 119 centimetres. The smallest I could expect it to be is 117 centimetres. That's kind of the usual expectation of what you would see in this. Error, that is a reason that the measurement may be wrong. So it could just be down to um, difficulty between looking at the graduations on something um, through to much more complicated reasons like um, calibration problems, uh, things like energy escaping into the surroundings, lots of different reasons. Precision, that is defined as the smallest change in a value um, that can be measured by an instrument. So um, when you use, say, a vernier caliper, that has a precision of 0 0.1 millimetres. When you use a micrometer, it has 0 0.01 millimetres. Um, so basically, it, it's the smallest change that you can measure. It's, it's the, the device itself is incapable of going any smaller. Now, um, if we say something is precise, that means that repeated measurements are the same. Accuracy means how uh, close the measure quantity is to the true quantity. So this is a classic diagram that you've probably seen before. Um, in this diagram, we have low accuracy and low precision. Here we've got higher accuracy because most of the points are clustered around here. And if I average them, the average is going to be in the center of this target. It would be averaging to about there. Here. The average point is there, so the average is inaccurate. It's far away from the true value. However, um, the precision is very high because, remember, to be precise, repeated measurements of the same thing should be close. So usually in day-to-day -day terms, you would say you, you, turn, you tend to use precise to mean sort of correct. At A level and in physics, it doesn't mean that. Precise has a very narrowly defined meaning, which means the repeats say the same thing. And you must, must, must memorize these. These are on your physics flashcards. You need to know what they actually were referred to by CIE. Okay, so when we think about the actual types of error, um, there are three main types. The first is, uh, well, actually, sorry, these two. Um, a systematic error, or a zero error, is an example of. So a zero error is an example of a systematic error. I should probably put my arrow actually uh, going the other way, really, shouldn't I? So let's do it uh, going up this way. So zero errors are examples of systematic errors. So a systematic error causes readings to be different from the true value by a consistent amount each time. Um, so the classic example with this is, let's say, here's my ruler. Um, and on my ruler, my ruler's uh, just got the, uh, the 10 centimeter mark there, but um, it was made a bit strangely. So actually the real 10 centimeter mark is here. So if I measured it um, with a different ruler, I see it 10 centimeters is there, but on this particular ruler, um, my 10 centimeter mark is here. So what that means is, whatever this distance is here, let's call that one centimeter, anything that I measure with this ruler will appear to be one centimeter longer than it really is. So every reading is wrong, but it's wrong by the same amount or a consistent amount. Um, and an example of that is a zero error. Um, so you see this all the time. If you look at a balance um, in the lab, 
And when there's nothing on the balance, so it's empty like that, um, it says 0 0.03 grams, then every single reading you take will be off by 0 0.03 grams. If I then come along um, and put on top of it um, an object, and it reads then, so here's an object that I'm weighing, or getting the, the, uh, the value of, and now it says uh, 1.26 grams, then the true value will be 1.23 grams, because it was always reading 0 0.03 grams too high. Um, so it's quite easy to remove because you just subtract whatever it reads at zero from all of your values. Random errors are ones that you can't correct for. Um, so random errors happen due to things like um, if you've got a pendulum going backwards and forwards and you're pressing start and stop, um, the random error would be your reaction time. It's not going to be a predictable amount every single time. Um, so the only way to get rid of a random error um, is by repeats. The more repeats you do, the lower the effect of these random errors on your results. So when you come to write down a reading, from now on this is what we always need to do. And I kind of started talking about this earlier. If I'm looking at this value here, um, in physics it would be quite rare to just write the what you measured. Instead you would write 118 centimetres plus or minus 1 centimetres. So we always write down the value, that's what you think the true value is, but then you also write down the uncertainty. So that tells you how much you could be wrong by. So when I write these two together, I am guaranteeing to my end user that the maximum this could possibly be is 119 centimetres, and the minimum this could possibly be is 117 centimetres. So I'm saying that my true value lies somewhere in this range. So calculating this uncertainty becomes very, very important, because um, for a lot of applications in physics, people will want to know what the... Uh, or what degree of certainty they have with it. Now sometimes you want to see, uh, you want a more kind of um, uh, succinct way of describing how um, accurate your result is or how precise your result is, and so for that we use percentage uncertainty. It's very simple, it's just what is the percentage of the uncertainty of the value. So in this case um, I would just do the uncertainty which is 1 divided by 118 and then multiply it by 100. And that will give me my uncertainty. So in this case, just grab my calculator out, that will be 1 divided by 118 multiplied by 100. So that comes to 0 0.85, oh, sorry, yeah, 0 0.8. Why did I say 0 0.8 and not 0 0.85? Um, usually we will only give percentage uncertainties to one significant figure, and the reason for that is most uncertainties are to one significant figure. So you can see here this is 1SF, therefore my percentage uncertainty will also be to one significant figure. If you do end up in a situation where you have uncertainty to two sig fig, obviously you give your uncertainty to two sig fig, so your percentage uncertainty to two sig fig. So you need to know how to find the uncertainty in a reading. Um, so it's quite simple. If you have a single measurement, then you just use the precision of the measurement device. Um, so in this case, this is a stopwatch. So here your uncertainty will be 0 0.01 seconds. Now that is different in other subjects. Um, in maths, for example, sorry, in, in biology, um, I think they use half a second because they talk about reaction time. In physics, we always use the device that you're measuring. Um, so for this ammeter, it would be uh, 0 0.1 amps, because this is set to amps. For this uh, ruler, it will be 0 0.1 centimetres. And for this device, you can see, uh, so that's 10, so it looks like each graduation um, has a value of 2, so this has an uncertainty of plus or minus 2 microamps on it. Yeah, it's one division. We never use half divisions in physics, um, only ever the divisions that we can see. If you have repeated measurements, then at that point you use half the range of your values. Um, so for example here, if I then find the percentage uncertainty, they're all zero, so this one will have an uncertainty of 0, 0.0. 
Here, though, my range is uh, 0 0.1, so it goes from 1 to 2, so from 5.1 to 5.2. So half the range will be 0 0.05. And then for this one, my range is 2. So this one will have a range of 0 point, sorry, an uncertainty of 0 0.1. One, um, and I almost wrote that to two sig fig, but I'm not going to write that to two sig fig because it's these are one significant figure, so my uncertainty is to one significant figure. So always half the range. What about if you do these repeats and you see they're all the same? Well, in that case, it's the precision of the measurement device. So I don't know what the measurement device is for this case, um, but I'm going to assume that. Um, it's to 0 0.1, so I probably actually have written this as 0 0.1 as my, sorry, uh, as my uncertainty here, um, because that will guarantee me, um, well, I, I normally would have only written down my uh, results to the position of the instrument anyway. Um, so again, as I was saying earlier, for a stopwatch, that's a special case. You might think, well, why would I um, write it to 0 0.01? Um, Sorry, that should say zero one. Um, why did I do zero point zero one? Well, it is the correct way of doing it. That's what CIE expect you to say. The exception, though, is of course if you're measuring it, uh, if you have to do a start and a stop, then you're going to get the same uncertainty each time. So um, for most readings, it would actually be zero point two if you don't have repeats with a stopwatch, um, because you have 0 0.01 seconds when you start and 0 0.01 seconds uncertainty when you stop. Um, so you might need to do that. However, it would be really bad practice for this reason to only ever have a single result with a stopwatch. So if you are measuring something in time, always do repeats so that you can then do half your range and that way you can get your uncertainty. Okay, so... Let's say I want to find the perimeter of this table. So I have a length of 118 centimetres, um, and I've got two of those, two lengths of 118, and then I've got two other lengths of 78 plus 78. So I could bash all that into a calculator um, and work out what I think the perimeter is, um, which comes to 392 centimetres. But the problem is that I don't know that it's precisely that. I have some uncertainty in these values. So what can I do? If I want to know, um, if I'm doing operations or anything, the simple rules are these. If I add or subtract numbers that have an uncertainty, then I add this, the absolute uncertainty together. And the reason for that is, if I imagine here's my 118 centimetre long uh, thing, but let's say that actually uh, I had the maximum uncertainty there. So that was actually 118 plus 1 centimetre. Well, if I then get another rod, and that one I also think is 118, but again I made the same, I've got the same um, absolute uncertainty to it, um, and this time again I just happen to be really unlucky, and my true value is one centimetre larger, well then you can see that the total will be, uh, what will that be, 118 times 2, I should probably ought to do that in my head really, shouldn't I? Um, so my calculated value would be 118 plus 118, which is 236, but I've got those two extra centimetres, so my absolute value will be two, three, eight centimetres. Um, and similarly, I hope you can see, if I actually uh, over-measured it and both of these were one centimetre shorter, um, then I would have got uh, two, three, four centimetres as the true length. So what I can say is, for each of these, you have to have an uncertainty of one. So I'm just going to add my percentage uncertainties together. So my final answer will be 392 plus or minus four centimetres. So my guarantee is I know for certain that this will not have a total perimeter of more than 396 centimetres, and it won't have a total perimeter of less than uh, 388 centimetres. That's what the plus or minus four is saying. It's saying the true value lies somewhere in this range. 
What about if I wanted to find the area? Well, when you go to university, what you'll do is a method called upper and lower bounds. So you'll say, what's the maximum possible area? The maximum possible area would be uh, 119 multiplied by 79. And then you say, what's the minimum possible area, which is 117 multiplied by 77. And then you find the difference between those. And that would be the plus or minus. At A level, they do a slightly simpler option. What you do instead is you just add the percentage uncertainties. So what I can say is the area, let's actually undo that because I wanted to try and keep my uh, colours consistent. So I'm going to say the general formula for the area is length times width. So that will be 118 multiplied by 78. So my expected value is 9,204. But now I need to calculate my percentage uncertainties. So for this one, um, I did that earlier, so that's 0.8%. For this one, this will be again plus or minus 1 over 78 multiplied by 100. So that comes to 1.3, uh, well again I shouldn't, I shouldn't um, I shouldn't leave this to one sig fig, um, so that's just going to be 1%. Um, so I need to add the percentage uncertainties to this. So this will be uh, 2904 plus or minus 1.8%. Um, and if I wanted, I could then turn that back into an actual number. Um, so it's plus or minus 1.8%. So, uh, sorry, let me just uh, change that slightly. Um, this is 9204 centimeters squared plus or minus 1.8 percent um, so if I find 1.8 percent of that that will be uh, 9204 multiplied by 1.8 um, so that's uh, sorry, that should be 1.8 and my calculator is not playing along thank you very much there we go. Oh, sorry, that's a 0.8 percent. So it should be um, sorry multiplied by 0 0.018. There we go. Um, so my final answer comes to 9204 plus or minus one. Sorry, plus or minus 116. And again, this is only to. Uh, I've got this here to two sig fig, so I'll give this to two sig fig. So plus or minus 170 centimeters squared. So I'm saying here that I guarantee the area of this uh, table is 9204, but it could be up to 170 larger or it could be 170 smaller, uh, but that's what I'm promising. Finally, if you raise something to a power, then you just multiply the percentage uncertainty by that power again. Um, so if I had um, uh, something that I'm squaring, I double my percentage uncertainty. Um, that doesn't come up so much at AS level, it tends to come up more at A2. Let's do a practice of that then. So, give the frequency with absolute uncertainty of a wave which travels at 500, sorry, 320 plus or minus 50 meters per second as a wavelength of 32.2 plus or minus 3 centimeters. And they've even given us the equation here that we need. So, first thing I'm going to do is convert this because centimeters are evil. So, this will be 0. Oops, 0. 3.22 plus or minus 0.003 centimetres. Um, and then they've even given me the equation here. They've given me what frequency is. So the absolute value um, will be uh, 320 over 32.2, which looking at these answers looks like it's going to come out as 990. But then I need to work out the uncertainty. So I need to go through these steps, calculate the percentage uncertainty here. So percentage U, that is 15 over 320 multiplied by 100. Sorry, uh, 15 divided by 320 times 100. That is 4.7%. I am going to two sig fig just at this point because then I'll round afterwards. For here, my percentage uncertainty is 0 0.3 over 32.2. You'll notice I don't need to um, 
to convert that out of centimetres this time. Um, that's because both these values are in centimetres. But there's no harm in, in converting if you wanted to. You try it at home and you'll see you get exactly the same answer. So that's uh, 0.93%. Therefore, the uh, total percentage uncertainty. I'm doing a division here, so remember, um, it's you add the percentage uncertainties whether you're multiplying or dividing. So even though I'm dividing, I still add them together. So that's 4.7 plus 0 0.93. So my absolute percentage uncertainty, sorry, my percentage uncertainty is 5.6%. Uh, so my absolute uncertainty will be 990 multiplied by 0 0.056. Again, don't forget to convert this from a percentage into a decimal. Hopefully you guys are all uh, familiar with that from maths. So that comes to 55.4, uh, which rounds to 60. So this is going to be my answer. Yeah, my absolute uncertainty to one sig fig is 60 hertz. That's therefore the answer I'm going for. Now, like I say, if you go and work this out mathematically and say, well, um, if I plug in the biggest possible number and the smallest possible number, you actually will get slightly different uncertainties. So this is not the rigorous, correct way that you will learn at university. That's a little bit annoying, I know, um, but it's just the way it is at A-level. Learn this method. It's what CIE expect. You'll always get it right if you do this.